is going on everybody happy tuesday i am icky timey and we are hanging out here at tuesday tea time thank you for popping on with us and if you are just joining us today we're going to have jason kim who is a young adult korean american 
professional minister in the gospel of Jesus. He has a flair for for Christ and for justice and for production. Um, and so we're, I'm just really happy to have him on. Hey, what's going on, Spencer? And good to see you on here as well, Pono. Um, I just wanted to invite you. If you've been following us on a weekly basis and you've been catching up with all the people that we've been spending time with, hanging out, talking about their life, I hope that you've been encouraged and that you've been inspired and that you've uh, been, been pushed to live to your fullest potential. Um, if you are watching along and you love us like we love you, please jump onto our YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe and smash the like button. That uh, will keep us going. We're at about 207, so we keep climbing. I'm really happy that we're there. We want to shoot for a, a thousand. That's our next goal. If we if we hit a thousand, we're gonna do something special. I don't know what it is yet, but we're gonna do something special, and you're gonna be involved in that. So please pop on over to our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash One House SoCal, and subscribe to it. Share it with a friend. Tell them, hey, you can't miss out on this. These are awesome. We're going to be making some short films real soon um, on some how-tos, um, how to create a live stream like this one. We want to teach you how to do this so that you can do it as well. We're going to talk about production and tech and all these other things as well as um, things and challenges that we're all going through. So go over there, subscribe, and then share the page with a friend. Tell them they've got to join as well. And uh, keep following us. Smash that like button because we're going to keep bringing it. We've got a bunch of really cool um, guests and people who are just doing meaningful good things in the world. Next week, next week, we've got our guy with us. Chad Manalo. He is a music producer. He's got a studio in Van Nuys and he loves Jesus. There's just just as plain as that. You're not going to want to miss out on him. Tell a friend. Um, Chad is also the uh, tech director over at Saddleback Church. He's done a lot. He's helped a lot of churches actually get off the ground with their worship production and worship leading and music. So you're not going to want to miss him out. He's going to give us a few tips on how to get our stuff going, whether you're a church leader, worship leader, or you're just like uh, a random guy by the name of Icky who's trying to do a stream from his house. You'll be able to do that with him. So um, join us next week when we are hanging out with Chad, 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 Manalo, lo, lo, lo. All right. That's uh, my pitch for next week. This week, I have the wonderful privilege of hanging out with a, uh, a, a young, uh, passionate, innovative dude by the name of Jason Kidd. Jason was born and raised in Washington, D.C., East Coast. He attended University of Maryland, Baltimore County, studying history. So he's a bit of a history buff, I'm taking it. Uh, he went to Andrews University and did ministry in Chicago. So my man um, was out in Chi-Town doing some good things. He moved to L.A. where he met his wife and became converted to the West Coast. God bless his soul. Um, and uh, he's adopted some dogs and he is expecting his son in November. A son. My friends, we're going to get to talk about his whole life coming up right here. So don't check out because we're going to get started. <music> What's up, Jason? Oh, man, we've got a little bit of glitch in here. Jace, can you hear us okay? All right. We, ooh, Jason, something sounds crazy right now, bro. You know, we were sounding good earlier, and uh, now that you're on, I think, like, you know, technology is scared of you, bro. Um, why don't you say hi, and let me see if we sound, how we sound. Yeah, you sound crazy right now, bro. Um, tell you what, I'm gonna see if we can switch up some. <laughs> it might, it might be me, Jason. I don't know. I don't want to disappoint. Let's, let's, let's see if we can fix this right now, my friends. This is the tech world we live in, my friends. This is how it works. Jason's gonna switch out his headphones and see if this works. Hi, Jason. Are you there? Jason. <laughs> no, the sound is crazy, Spence. Yes, sir. That's right. We're gonna Can you hear me? On. Yay! There he is. What's going on, my man? We can kind of hear you now. 
All right, you can hear me? Yes. Yes, we All can. All right, there you go. There you go. There you go. <laughs> What's up, Jason? How are we doing today, bro? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I am very good. Thank you for joining me today. Now, you know, you are um, a savior of all saviors. For those of you who are watching along, you knew that Chad Manalo was supposed to come on today, but um, we had a scheduling mix up with Chad and Jason was like, yo, man, I'll come on and, and we'll talk about some stuff. So I'm really excited about having you on today, Jace. Um, thank you so much for coming through for us, all of us. Here on Tuesday Tea Time, we like to talk about, we always start with what we're drinking because we want to pretend like we're not in the digital world, like we're together actually sitting around a place drinking something so jace tell me what are you drinking bro i am drinking uh ginger tea with honey um i was gonna come in with like just some basic coffee but i found out what you were drinking so i was like oh i gotta <laughs> step up my my tea game so got some ginger got some honey all right man that's that's very good um and why do you usually have that around the house is that something that you did or is this special for the tuesday no i um i do like ginger tea it's like a korean thing um like the authentic way is you just literally boil up like ginger root in a, in a teapot and then you mix it with some honey um it's supposed to be like medicinal kind of like when you catch colds and stuff right um but i just like i, I really like ginger i hate ginger that comes with sushi yes thank like, you i hate it let's speak to that I, yes i'm with you i love ginger tea ginger ale <laughs> ginger <laughs> candy ginger beer it's weird i don't i don't know what's up with that <laughs> ginger has this purifying burn that i don't appreciate very much so <laughs> i can take it in like very small hints but you uh -huh. know you, you 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 get too much in you and it's gonna burn jesus burn <laughs> Thank you. Uh, sure. Ke and Kevin, uh, my man, Kevin Kamado just shared that he is uh, drinking apple juice with the kids. And so thank you for joining us with your drink, Kevin. I hope the rest of you are drinking along something uh, with us as we take off into our Tuesday tea time. Uh, so, Jason, we want to talk about your life as a Korean American, what it's like, your experience here in the world, in ministry. Um, so let's just talk really quick. I know I've mentioned already, but what is your nationality? Uh, I'm Korean, I'm Korean American, I guess. Mm. So both of your parents are Korean? Yeah, both are Korean. Excellent. Okay. Are they from the same place in Korea? Um, my dad grew up near Seoul, so that's the capital of Korea, but um, definitely a little bit more, not like in the downtown area. Yeah. Uh, my mom is from a different place in Korea that I don't really know, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she grew up there. So like roughly the same area, I guess, but you know, Korea's not that big, so. Right, right, right. Um, now you said your dad grew up in, in Seoul? Mm -hmm. how, how do you say that? It's a uh, two syllable. It's Seoul. 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 Okay, for a second. Thank you. I'm I'm a grown man, and I've been saying it wrong my whole life. I want to apologize to all of my Korean <laughs> friends, as I've probably offended your ears, because most of us Americans would just say Seoul, right? Right, right. Um, I mean, the same with like our last names too. Like my last name isn't pronounced Kim; it's Kim. <laughs> um, but, Ooh, that's so like Kim. from Andrews, we have uh, Dr. Richard Che. And he makes sure everyone calls him like Chet, and he'll correct you. Right. But right. usually people will call him like Choi, and so <laughs> we're all used to it. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say like, oh my name is Jason Kim. It's like Jason Kim. That's correct. <laughs> Kim. So. Kim. Is Kim? Kim. All right. It's like almost it's like a G sound, not a hard K sound. Ah, and it and, and say Seoul one more time for me. Seoul. 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 So, okay, my friends, there you go. You've just learned how to say um, soul correctly, which I've just said wrong. But uh, <laughs> it's going to take time, all right? All right. It's all good. I will say it right immediately. I mean, eventually, my friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, but now you're, you weren't born in Korea. Uh, where did you grow no. up? I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., um, specifically suburbs of Maryland. Ooh. What we see. Nice, nice. Now, um, was that was that near a city, a town, or was it more rural? Uh, so I live like the specific city, I guess, was Silver Spring. Um, it's like twenty minutes north of DC. Got it. Um, 
So, yeah, we live between D.C. and Baltimore. Population size? Um, it's one of the bigger cities in Maryland. Mm. Um, like, a lot of, like, Discovery Channel's headquartered out there. I don't oh. know if that's a thing. <laughs> but they're headquartered out there, uh, a couple other things. So it's, like, a pretty decent city. Okay, okay. So uh, what was it like, then, for you in this decent-sized city to grow up as a first-generation American with mm-hmm. immigrant parents? So the place I grew up in, um, like elementary, middle school, mm-hmm. uh, I lived with a lot of other immigrant families, actually. It was a heavily Hispanic neighborhood. Um, so I live people from Maryland. I live near like Wheaton, Maryland, uh, which is like a smaller area. Um, so a lot of us were in the same situation. Like We were the first to be born in America. We have immigrant parents. So in that kind of macro level, we all kind of had the shared experience. Mm. Um, as a Korean, it was a little bit different because there were no other Koreans. Like the school oh. I went to, there were like three other Koreans um, <laughs> and maybe like 10 Asians total. And so it, it was definitely interesting uh, growing up uh, in that sense. It's it's like this sense of like, I belong and I don't belong. Right, yeah. Because <laughs> like, like, yeah, we're all immigrants, but you're from like, Ecuador, I'm from <laughs> Korea, so. And it was heavily bit of that. populated with Hispanic families. So did you find yourself actually beginning to relate to and hanging out with uh, more Hispanics than, than anything? Or how did that work for you? I did. Um, like my closest friends, incidentally, were uh, Southeast Asian. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're Cambodian and Indonesian. But then like a lot of like my school friends were Hispanic. Um, and so definitely was more comfortable with like a Hispanic style culture, I guess, more so than American. Um, and then because we went to a Korean church, that was still very strong too. So right. there was a very distinct like school life and church life mm. uh, dynamic going on. Interesting. Were there a lot of young, uh, young kids? Were there kids your age at the Korean church there? Yeah, so the church I went to as a child, um, it's one of the bigger Korean churches on the East Coast. And so, I mean, there was like 15 of us, my age group. And then, I mean, the EM was huge. It was like pushing 150 back then. So it was a pretty big group. Wow, wow. So what is something that uh, interesting that you practiced in your home? By the way, uh, more power to your parents. I want to I wanna give your parents some love right now. They're probably never going to see this, but shout out to Kim, 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 <laughs> to the Kim family. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> because you didn't grow up around a heavily populated Korean community, and yet you speak Korean. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's fantastic. Because, by the way, a lot of us grow up in cultural families, and we can't speak our mother tongue very well, if at all. Um, so more power to them. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and how that came about. But um, yeah. what is something interesting that you practiced in your home that was not necessarily American? So it was something that, you know, culturally was something you all did and you knew this was your thing. Um, I mean, I guess obviously food is one of the big ones, like what we ate, um, the smells, taking off your shoes for a lot of Asian people. That's yeah. It's that for like my family um, and for a lot of other Korean families too, like uh, we would store um, some stuff. Like a lot of our food is fermented. Yes. And so now I just buy them like from H Mart and it's in like nice plastic packaging, like doesn't smell, but like we used to like ferment it in our backyard. Oh. Um, so there are these like huge like clay jars in our deck. Uh, and it was filled with uh, soybean, and it's, you know, the polite way is fermenting, but it's rotting in these <laughs> jars. Um, and so, that's obviously not American. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Uh, were you, you always aware that it wasn't an American thing? Yeah, yeah, I was pretty sure because one, I knew Americans back then didn't eat like we call it tenjang chiga, like they didn't eat it. And so right. I was pretty sure they didn't have jars of tenjang in the house. <laughs> Just hanging out Nowadays, house. like, last night I read an Epicurious article about tenjang, and it's like, what is going on? 
but yeah, I knew that was not American to have rotted soybean in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question from Kevin here. That was a good question. Um, did the uh, did the two ever those two dynamics ever mix your church life and your school life? Was there a place that they intersected? Um, interestingly, so I moved after my freshman year of high school uh, to a more not like more white or. I don't know what to call it, but sure, more white uh, suburb. Yeah. Um, and there, the two literally collided because all my church friends went to that same high school as me. Wow. So I would see my church friends during the week. Uh, so in that sense, that's when it came. But then before, no, they were so separate. Like, Wow. So. And you're married. So uh, tell us a little bit about your wife, man. Yeah, uh, her name is Kim Rowe. Kim Rowe. Um, she's a speech and language pathologist. Uh, she works for the Walnut School District um, out here in California. Uh, she's born and raised Southern California. Um, so went yes. to school. Uh, where did she go? She went to um, Fullerton, Cal State Fullerton. All right. Uh, Loma Linda for grad. So she's been in SoCal her entire life. Hey, someone's um, got to make money in your family because it ain't you, bro. You're a pastor. <laughs> right? <laughs> God bless your wife, bro. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. And she's Korean as well. She's Korean, yes. She's Korean. Is she first generation Korean like yourself? Yeah. yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So when you two started hanging out and started talking, did you find any kind of familial connections? Um, from your parents or the community anywhere? Was there any place that you guys had crossed before? So one of the things that really connected us is how similar our family dynamic was. Mm. So we both have like a bunch of cousins, but our cousins are significantly older than us. Um, so like I have a younger sister, so it's like us two, and then there's a 10 year gap and then it's my next set of cousins. And same for my wife, too. It's like her and her sister. And there's this huge gap, and then there's her older cousins. Um, like, our oldest cousins are, like, in their mid-40s right now. Oh, man, so, they're super old. Yeah. So <laughs> that's kind of a rare thing to find. And it was just so weird that both of our families were like that. Yeah. And so we have, like, baby cousins or, like, nephews and nieces uh, that are, like, 10, 12, 13 years old. And so oh. that was definitely something that bonded us. Oh, good. Um, so good. The Korean Adventist community is super small, and mm -hmm. so when I first started dating her, I actually called my mom and I was like, <laughs> "Hey, there's this girl I'm dating. Her name is Kim Ro. Uh, this is her dad's name. This is her mom's name. Are we're we related?" related. <laughs> no. Uh, my mom's like, "No, we're not related." I was like, "Okay." And then I found out her like second cousin went to my home church, and so I called back. I'm like, "Are you sure?" <laughs> Her second really cousin weird. is, you know, so and so from church. Yeah. Like, no, don't worry, you're not really <laughs> So there was that connection too. Oh man, that would have made it just really bad at the wedding. <laughs> I was legit, like, low key, like, waiting for someone to be like, oh, like cousin, and then. <laughs> but thankfully, none of that happened, and we're good. <laughs> very good, very, very good, man. So, um, you guys are expecting a boy. Yes, we Congratulations, are. Congratulations, <laughs> man. That is huge. Yeah. yeah. When, when, um, when are you due? Uh, November 8 is the official due date. Awesome. Very good. Very good. Are you guys excited? Yeah, definitely excited. Um, I am also equally terrified. <laughs> you should be. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <Scared of mine. laughs> <laughs> but yeah, definitely excited. <laughs> um, the experience of having a child or expecting a child is one of those things that's like in your heart, you're like, I'm excited, but it's freaky. I don't know what's going to happen. And there's a lot that happens in those first few years. But have you and your wife, Kim, spoken about what your hopes are for your children? Um, here in America, have you spoken about some of your fears? You know, what your hopes are for them? Um, not specifically about our child. I mean, we do talk about kind of, again, kind of larger issues of yeah. immigrants and third generations and things like that. So in that sense, we talk about it in a very like general sense, but not specifically for our, our, our boy. No. Good, 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 good. 
Uh, so is, is there something that in your cultural family group uh, was very common that you thought everyone did until you uh, grew up and realized, oh, snap, this was something only we did? Was there any experiences or, or things like that that you just thought in your mind everyone did? You just assumed every household did this thing, Chase? Yeah. I don't know if this is a Korean thing or an Asian thing or I guess East Asian thing, but there's a lot of like plants that are edible that grow in the wild. Yeah. And whenever we'd like go camping or on a walk, if they saw like an edible root or a plant, they would like harvest it from the side of the street. Uh, and I thought that was just normal. <laughs> like once a year, my family and these a couple other families would drive to Pennsylvania. It's like hour and a half away. And there's this like huge like shipping center that's obviously closed on Sundays, but they have a huge uh, chestnut tree, and we'd like be picking chestnuts on the side of the highway for like hours. And I thought that's what you do, I thought like other people come other Sundays and pick chestnuts. Yeah. Uh, I realized no, most people don't pick plants from the side of the road and <laughs> steal chestnuts from <laughs> shipping companies. That is so. so awesome. That was definitely not. Yeah, I was like. Oh, so what we're doing is illegal. You all okay. don't pick the ferns around here. This is not for public use. <laughs> that is yeah. awesome. Uh, I, I know that in our park over here, we've got some older Korean ladies that, you know, they come into the park and they would just pull it out stuff. You know, they'd be mm. taking it home with them. And uh, I just watch and delay I light. I just think it's so, so cute to watch them pull up there and, you know, rip it out. And they're like, I'm taking this home. I'm, I'm so, this. yeah, it was like, at first it's just normal. So they're like, oh. Yeah, that's gonna be food later, and then it's just like super embarrassing. Like, like come on, let's like just go to the grocery store. You don't need to do that. And then now it's like, <laughs> oh, I guess it's kind of cute. So <laughs> you kind of go through the roller coaster of emotions. <laughs> do you get tempted every so often uh, here and there to just rip out something that you see as you're walking along? <laughs> like, oh, snap, I, I, I can't identify it. Like, I don't want to be picking up like poison ivy <laughs> and like cooking it in my food. Um, <laughs> There is a small part of me that kind of wishes I can identify so I can pick it, but yeah. um, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> what about your kids? How have you spoken? Uh, have you and Kim spoken about how you want to help them learn about your culture more? Have you guys talked about those kind of things, being intentional about that? Yeah, we ha we have. Um, you know, kind of going back to what you're saying about language. Yeah. Like in our families, all of our our cousins, they taught their kids how to speak Korean first. Mm. Um, and so a lot of them until age like maybe three or four didn't know English. They only knew Korean. Right. Um, but then when you start going to school, you switch completely to to English. And the reason why, like my wife and I kept Korean is because if we didn't speak Korean, we can't communicate with our parents. They just right. You can't talk to them. So we had to continue. And so that's something we talked about, too, like how intentional do we want to be once they start going to school like do we want to impose like a language thing but then is that even necessary yeah. uh things like that and so we do want them to know the history and there's a whole story with like my son's korean name that i don't know if you want me to get into but yeah yeah um, his korean name's icky right um close uh, <laughs> <God. laughs> um, so so like the kim last name is super common and everyone thinks all the kims are related but there's like nine different branches of the kim last name yeah. um and only one of them is like the the official royal kim um and so apparently i am part of the official royal kim line and so for korean names um there's a pattern that goes down the generation so korean names are two syllables and there's a specific uh, word alternating syllables. So like my current name is Hong Te. Hong Te. So the Te is the, we call it Torlin. Te is a special uh, character and it's on the second syllable. So my son wow. is uh, Yong. Yeah. So that's the first syllable. Uh -huh. So you can track like literally from the first king all the way down to 2020. And so my dad, when we got married, um, he basically called dibs on on naming our son and so from korea he got the book the family book and yeah literally the first page is like the original king kim yep and then every son after that you see his name oh, wow. and then at the end there's a little space 
after my name and he wrote in my son's name um and so stuff like that like i think it's pretty cool and uh i think it's nice for him to know like hey it's not like your grandfather just picked a random name like there's a little bit of a history and a and a pedigree and such that's um, awesome so what is his name what's his korean name are, are you sharing that yet or oh sure it's uh kim young kim young sa kim young sa kim young wow yeah. very we good found out last week congratulations <laughs> bro congratulations um so let me ask a couple questions um What's up with K-pop, bro? Can I ask about that? <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> why is, it, sure. why is this such a phenomenon? And maybe those of you watching along can share why it is, uh, especially in terms of uh, from the Korean perspective, which you know you get to share with us today. What or why um, has this thing gotten so big? It's like global. You know, I honestly don't know. I listened to a lot of K-pop when I was in middle school. Ah. So this was like the... I guess technically the second wave of K-pop, um, and you know back then no one else was listening to it except for like Korean people, and then you know now it's become this this big cultural phenomenon. Um, yeah. I think one reason is K-pop tends to be very like earwormy, like mm. once you hear it you just can't get it out of your head. Right. Um, and I don't know if this is true. The rumor is is that like most K-pop is generated in like a studio in Norway. Um, they just make the beats <laughs> there right? and they ship them to Korea. And it's like it's it's so weird because in Korea it's like it's like a factory. Like you, it's like an academy. It's like soccer. It's like you have all these young kids that try out. They go to like JYP Entertainment. Um, they like train them, test them, and the best ones advance. And then you're left with like six. And like, all right, we'll do a boy band of six or two of three. And it's a, it's a fact that just turn them out. And um, yeah, I think that's why. It's because like the music is very catchy. And I just feel like it's kind of engineered specifically for like there's catchiness. Deep, there's, and, there's definite deep love for it. Deep, deep love. I mean, I know uh, yeah. young adults, you know, of all <laughs> nationalities who just love them some K-pop. So I, you know, I just thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, that inside tip. I don't know if it's true, but that's what I hear. I actually hate on K-pop. <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't changed since I was in middle school. Like, it, it hasn't changed. There was no evolution of, K- of K-pop. Um, but if it ain't broke, just, you just ride it till the wheels fall. I guess off, so. Apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about um, your role. We're gonna talk about your ministry role and just roles that you've played in life. Um, you are a pastor, a minister. Where do you pastor at, my man? Uh, so currently I'm pastoring at the L.A. Central Korean Church. Uh, specifically, it's the Living Water Fellowship uh, Ministry under L.A. Central Korean. Uh, that's that's fantastic. You, They have had a history of, of, of good young adult pastors. I, I've had the wonderful privilege of working with, um, with all, most of them that have come through there. And you are no exception to that, my bro. You are phenomenal. I've, I've enjoyed getting to know you and watching you in action. Um, and I, I just thought about uh, why. Because so many of our young pastors are in ministry. They, they love ministry. But if you know anything about ministry, it can be tough. It can be rough because you love God and you love people, but the people you are loving and mentoring for God oftentimes um, don't love you back so much, right? It, it's it's a tough <laughs> job. There's your hours. People say, ah, oh, you only work one day a week for a couple hours on your sermon, but you really work overtime all over the place. So why did what drew you to ministry? Why, why did you say, man, God, I want to do this for you? Um... Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I I was always involved in my church uh, as a lay leader, and I always enjoyed doing it. And, like, mentorship is a huge thing for me. Um, I benefited from incredible mentors in my life, and I always wanted to do the same uh, for other people. Um, but I think the thing that drew me into specifically, I guess, like, full-time ministry uh, was kind of the realization that, specifically in the Korean church, but I'm sure this happens, you know, across the board, um, there's a tendency for G- a God or Jesus to be presented in a very specific way. And the way to connect with God or Jesus is through that very specific, narrow pathway. And through my growth in faith, I realized 
you know, God's a lot bigger than that. There are so many different ways to connect with God, to interact with God. And I wanted to kind of share that with other people because I felt like a lot of my peers were leaving the church because it was like either you fit through this very narrow hole to reach God or you need a, something wrong with you. And I was like, no, that's not true. There's so many different avenues to experience God. Uh, I want to help you find those avenues. And so that was one of the big things that drew me into to full-time ministry because that's not something you can really do like on the side. Um, yeah, true, true. Plus, I, I, I really enjoy doing it. Um, yeah. When, it's, when, it's hard, what age did sure. you know? When, when did you know, like, boom, I, I want to serve God. This is what I want to do. No, it was a kind of a process. Um, that, like, kind of light bulb moment happened. It first happened at the end of my freshman year of college. Wow. And then, like, the more formal entrance into pastoral ministry happened uh, my junior year of college. Fantastic. And what so year was that? During those two times, it was kind of like the struggling and the yeah. what am I going to do? And then it was like the first step in. Because you did you history. You studied history, mm -hmm. really, right? I did. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, yeah, that was a real struggle. So what year uh, was your junior year? Do you remember? It was 2008. 2008. So I don't know if you're able to see the screen, Jason. Have you been watching our screen on, on the live? Um, I've got a couple, the live. I've got a couple pictures up from 2005 that I just threw up here. It, one looks like you're on a mountaintop with some friends. The other looks like you photobombed in the front. And you were wearing look what looked like a black jacket there. Um, these were both pictures from 2005. Um, during these times in your life, were you considering ministry already at that time? Uh, 2005, I was not. Okay. Um, I think I know what picture you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, at that time, I was not considering. <laughs> I mean, not that I was stalking your Facebook or anything. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's also this other picture I just wanted to throw up. You were wearing a jersey, number 26. Is that you? It looked like a Redskins jersey. Yeah, it probably is. 26 <laughs> were, or 21. You were throwing up a gang sign. Um, I just want to oh, put, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to put that out there. Were you thinking <laughs> about ministry at that time, or were you thinking about gang uh, gang activities, Jason? <laughs> um, I need okay, to know so what know your what wife needs to know. About. It's, it's not a gang <laughs> sign. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a commemorative sign for, for Sean Taylor. Um, if any of you out there who know Sean Taylor is, uh, you know what's up. So at that time, yes, I was thinking of ministry. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> very, very cool. Okay. Um, as a pastor, how have you created a strategic actions for you to get equipped about being aware and being and, and also being uh, equipped to empower your church to rock on and deal with um, with issues around our world? Well, you know what? Before I ask that question, let me ask this question: How does how does the um, cultural church that you minister in relate to what's happening around our world today? Yeah, that's like a more complicated question than it should be. Because within the mm. Korean church, there's two parts of it. There's a Korean church and there's the English church. And it's something I didn't know until the la since I moved here. Um, I thought most cultural or ethnic churches had that kind of dual church system, but I only realized recently that it's really only the Korean church that has such a distinct ministry. Um, Korean churches, the, the English ministry, the EM as we call it, functions almost like a completely separate church. Mm. And so you we, wow. we call it the two church, one roof model. Um, and so some churches, it's like, even like the finances are completely separate, De separate board, separate finances, wow. separate everything. Um, and so because of that, the way that the Korean church deals with, with what's happening around them is very different. Because on the Korean side, it's still like not my business. Let them figure it out. Like we're just going to do what we got to do. Yeah. And on the English side, it's there's a there's two different camps, basically. Um, you know, Korean Americans, we've benefited tremendously in America. Um, within just a single generation. So like our parent generations were like, you know, liquor store, laundromat, small business, stuff like Don't that. And then their kids are like doctors. They're making, you know, bank. And so a lot of Korean Americans, we kind of have that keep your head down, keep to yourself mentality. Plus we have all this 
privilege and, and wealth. And so there's still this this element of like, yeah, just keep your head down, work hard, make your money, provide for your family. And then there's fortunately a growing group of younger Korean Americans who are like, no, we, we need to step up, we need to be more involved, we need to speak out, you know, we're all affected, even though we may not be black, we may not be under attack, we, we need to support um, the communities that are being attacked. And so there's this like, three way <laughs> uh, puzzle, almost, um, that's happening in the Korean church. So is it um, back to the, 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 the two operating systems, the two mm -hmm. under one roof? Um, because that's kind of a new idea to me. Uh, is that mm -hmm. is that common? Is that common operations, common practice? Yeah. Um, any Korean church that has enough of a EM group, they will look for a full time EM pastor. So that is essentially EM what is I am. English ministry, correct? I'm sorry. A EM stands for English ministry. Yes, English okay. ministry. Um, and so I mean, they're like Loma Linda Korean Church. It's it's the biggest Korean church. Uh, in America, and so the Korean side they have like 300, English side they have like 200, and it's literally two, <laughs> they have two different buildings for each of the ministries, wow. that's common, maybe not to that scale, uh, but even our church, you know, we average about 40-ish English ministry members, but we operate almost completely independently from the Korean side, um, visions are different, you know, the target audience is different too, you know, Korean sides are targeting Korean immigrants, we're targeting Boyle Heights, uh, East LA. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of conflict sometimes that happens right. there too. Right. Um, let me ask about the, um, is this this format, this uh, operational structure, is this something that is unique to the Adventist church or have you noticed it um, also in uh, other denominations, um, in the Korean churches just in general? So I talked to someone who grew up in the Adventist church. He now goes to um, a non-Adventist church, Korean church. Mm -hmm. And this seems to be uniquely a Korean American Adventist thing. Um, what he's saying is even his Korean Sunday church, um, most of everything is done in Korean. Um, and they'll have Got stuff it. for the English speaking group once in a while. But the priority obviously is the Korean speaking congregation. Right. Um, whereas... Yeah, again, in Korean American Adventist churches, that's that's not a. It's a whole separate thing. And mm. So yeah, it seems to be uniquely for Korean American Adventists. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Okay, um, so I, how does the church, the Korean church, view um, e, the young people? What what is the role of young people in the in the in the church? Yeah, so that kind of the thing too so they refer to young people as the youth, the youth. Um, <laughs> always the, the Korean word is chungyeon, which means youth or uh, technically it means unmarried youth ah. so someone who has not entered into adulthood but the problem is and this is true for like Korean American generation like beyond the church too is like you're always treated kind of like a kid um, even like me and my mom there's this issue because she keeps treating me like I'm like five and I'm like mom I'm like 33 I have a kid on the way you know yeah. and I think it's just a cultural thing which is understandable but yeah yeah from a church perspective it's always a youth um, and when we have any kind of inter-church stuff or there's a worship or whatever um, it's always like oh the youth people and I'm like <laughs> we got people in their 50s and 60s <laughs> like, and it's not even like once you get to a point in life, you can be called an adult. It's yeah. almost like a language thing. If you speak predominantly English and you're in that side of the church, you are the youth group. Oh, um, interesting. And that causes issues because this, because they're still viewed as a youth group, but functionally right. we are an actual full church. There's a lot of, I guess, issues that kind of pop up mm. when you have a glass ceiling like that. Right. Wow, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that's interesting. So it's got to be a, a challenge to uh, grow into that position. Now I know that probably much much like many cultural churches, the pastoral position is considered probably a really um, high position in the community. Is that correct? Yeah, that's definitely true. So okay. how then um, does that dynamic change when you have a young person like you who is also a pastor? 
um, in that position? Is is there what's the discrepancy look like there for you? Yeah, it's weird because the position itself is kind of this, you know, Korean culture, East Asian too, is a very hierarchical. Yeah. And so it's a very high position in the hierarchy. But I'm also <laughs> youth. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's weird because some people are able to kind of understand the position and they treat you very like, like they would in like a Korean speaking pastor. And there's other people who like are kind of stuck in the middle and, um, you know, but definitely, so like something as simple as like manual labor, right? Setting up chairs. Yeah. Um, if the senior pastor started doing it, like people will flip out, like what is going on? No, no. Right, but then if the EM pastor doesn't do it, they also flip out, like what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, like I think we should, but it's right. just so interesting because it's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a small example, I guess. <laughs> is there a is there a persona about the pastor? that you think um, actually makes your job much more difficult to do because you have to live up to this particular standard? And if so, what does that look like for someone um, in your position who works for a um, Korean community? What do you think um, could be some things that hinder ministry because of the persona um, that you have to take on? I think for Korean churches, um, the pastoral role or position kind of goes beyond the role itself. Um, so what I mean by that is the pastor fulfills social functions beyond what most non-Koreans would think of what a pastor should do. Um, and so they help with like, especially with like kind of the older people, they help with like setting up their social security, uh, dealing with landlord. Like it's a very integral part of the community in Korea. And I think there's a little bit of residue or like residual effect on my end because in my ministry that is definitely not what i do right like i have a very clear function as a pastor um like no one needs my help calling the bank to set up a checking account like if i offered like <laughs> you know i get kicked out of the church probably um but that expectation i think maybe not that specific but that expectation of filling the role of something bigger than a pastor, I think sometimes happens. It's not like a acute thing, like I don't feel it all the time, but yeah. sometimes I get a little bit of it in certain meetings when, you know, you read between the lines and yeah. stuff like that. Wow. Um, okay, so if you are just catching up with us, I am hanging out with Pastor Jason Kim, who is doing some fantastic work in the Boyle Heights area. He's working with an EM group, English Ministries, at a Korean church, um, and he's innovative. He's a dad to be, um, and we are just talking about life and faith and a bunch of other stuff. We're gonna move into a game that I like to call "Love One, Leave One." Before we do, I've got a couple quick questions I want to shoot to you, Jason, um, and then mm -hmm. we'll move right into there. Uh, the first one is. Uh, uh, Spencer asked, um, is the Korean church going through Korean guilt type situation? Do they, are, are they feeling that? I'm assuming referring to kind of Black Lives Matter and yes. everything that's happening. Um, the Korean church, the Korean speaking church, no. The English ministry, I think it's about half and half. Um, so like my church definitely we're we're more we're much younger we're working professionals so there's a lot of like we we got to go out and do stuff people marching putting up stuff on Instagram all the time so it's definitely mixed half and half I think cool um, so it depends on the depends the language on. I guess excellent and then Jillian she says uh, do you ever have a hard time uh, explaining the general lack of respect fully Americanized people have for the position of the pastor. Could you repeat the question? I think I got some of this. Sorry, Jillian uh, asked, do you ever have a hard time explaining the general lack of respect fully Americanized people have for the position of the pastor? Do I have a hard time? I mean, not a hard time. Um, and I guess in my position, I get a little bit of both because it, it is a little bit of both. It's like they understand the position is super high, but then, you know, they're also American, so... It's a little bit different, but right. it's it's 
it's not hard to explain. It's just I can explain it, but whether they accept it or not is a whole nother, whole nother thing. So, it. It, yeah, it's a little bit of both. Got it, got it. All right, man. Thank you so much for fielding those. Let's get into Love One, Leave One. I love this time. I hope you love it too. We're about to get rocking. Um, Jason, I'm going to give you a minute and a half on the clock. And um, in that minute and a half, I'm going to give you options between two things. You're going to have to choose one of those things as something that you will love and the other as something you will leave. Whatever you love, you can have consistently in your life for the rest of your life and enjoy it with you and your family. Whatever you leave, all of humanity no longer gets to experience from this point forward it just drops off the existence for the rest of the world okay um, we've got a minute and a half now um, to be able to expedite our time and for you to be more efficient go ahead and just say love this and we'll know that what you mean is you're leaving the other thing if you are watching along we want you to get ready on your keyboards let's jump into this game together um, type us and let us know what it is um, your option will be as we begin to begin to play with Jason Jason you ready yeah. You got a minute and a half on the clock, baby. Let's do this. Ready? All right, everyone. Get your keyboards out. Here we go. Bibimbap or Chop Che? I uh, love Bibimbap. All right. Uh, skydiving or bungee jumping? Love skydiving. All right. KFC or Taco Bell? Love Taco Bell. <laughs> Even with their shortened menu? They've got a shortened menu now. I hate KFC more than I love Taco Bell. Oh, there you are. There you are. Indie films or mockumentaries? Oh, I love mockumentaries. <laughs> okay. Mulan the cartoon or Mulan real life? Oh, man. I, I guess I would love Mulan the cartoon. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we have Beyonce or uh, Whitney Houston? Oh, this is gonna prove your I age. I love bro. Whitney Houston. <laughs> love. You're an Power old balance. soul. You're an old soul. <laughs> yeah. Thor or The Incredible Hulk? Oh, I love Thor. Ah, uh, LeBron James or Kevin Durant? <sighs> Nineteen <laughs> seconds, bro. Just because he's from DC, I guess I love. No, I love, Le I love LeBron James. Okay, LeBron James. LeVar Arlington or Ryan Kerrigan? Do you know who those people are? Yeah, dude, I love LeVar Arlington. All right. Um, Kobe Bryant after the Achilles injury or Michael Jordan when he played for the Wizards? Oh, Michael Jordan, Wizards, easy. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, very good. You did well, my friend. Thank you, everybody, for <laughs> for playing along. Our, our list was a little bit longer, Jason, but you, you did what you could with what you had, bro. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, let's talk about uh, a current event uh, or current events generally across our, our landscape today. Are there current events that have caused some pressure on your community? And, and you know, th this could be – this is various, really. So you can mm -hmm. you can pick any one of the current events, but is there any specific or particular ones that are putting real pressure on the Korean community at this time? Um, I mean, I think we can go through both of like the big ones. I mean, the first one, COVID. Um, I haven't personally experienced it, and none of my people in Southern California have necessarily experienced it, but I hear about it elsewhere in the country but there is obviously an uptick of uh, i guess you call it harassment towards asians because of of covid yeah um, and so you know for most people korean chinese japanese we all look the same so we're all chinese mm. uh, and so <laughs> you know you can be in the grocery store and someone start attacking you for being the cause of covid and you're like oh i'm not chinese i'm korean but they don't care or don't know and so that's definitely something that is more picked up on the larger radar of korean american churches like on right. the korean side too with like what's happening with black lives matter and, and the protests and such um it's interesting because you know i didn't grow up in la mm. i grew up obviously in dc but no one's there's perfect. a I'm sorry no one's perfect <laughs> sure <laughs> um, 
But there is a very strong connection between um, protests and the Korean community. Um, with the Rodney King riots, uh, right. you know, it was a Korean own business and there's like pictures of like you know old korean dudes on the roof with like rifles yeah. you know back in uh, 94 or 92 um and so because of that link i i think even today when like older koreans see the news and they see this happen for yeah. them they jump straight back to 92 um and I, I think that does color their perspective a little bit. And sure. I know one of the big push for younger Asians uh, when this whole thing was starting was like, you know, talk to your parents, like have that uncomfortable conversation, tell them why, like what is Black Lives Matter and why do Black Lives Matter? And when you try to have that conversation, it's really difficult besides it just being a difficult discussion to have because there's yeah. that inherent past issue that took place and it's it's hard like yeah. even in, in dc like my parents were small business owners and like stories of what happened in la trickled to the other side of the country and there was a sense of like oh is it going to happen here too kind of a thing um and so you know it's definitely not just isolated to la although obviously that's where the the emotions are the most strongest but yeah that's I don't know if you call that pressure, but it, well, it's definitely it is, trigger points because of the association sure, right. emotionally that happened um, during those times. I, we we I was around during that time. Um, mm -hmm. I was a baby, you know, because it was '92. I think it was like three or four, um, but I recall the time, um, and uh, it was it was definitely uh, very tense in the air. But you know, I re I recall watching a few uh, sitcoms. By the way, I was a lot older. I was not three or four at the time. '92, <laughs> '94. Uh, I wish I were, but I wasn't. Um, and um, I even remember some shows that, you know, they did some reconciliatory type things, like they tried to educate, which was, I, I thought, a really good way to reach across um, to try to make some connections and try to heal some some misunderstandings. Um, one of the things was, it, I forget which sitcom it was, but it had a, it was about a family and um, the individual gave money and the Korean owner of the store um, didn't take it from their hand. They, w they wanted to put it down on the counter and mm. the show the whole show was about how angry the family was it happened to be that individual was african-american the family was really upset that the korean didn't take the money from them because they thought they were too good to touch the money um and, but i think the store owner had a daughter or a child where they where they had conversation and anyways the whole show uh, sitcom ended um where they talked about how um it was a sign of respect or something like that uh this is and this is really just me reaching way back like a couple decades pulling it out of my memory but it, but it's stuck in my mind as something important about how um we need to be able to listen and understand and learn and there might be things that we're missing or assuming about a different cultural group that we we aren't very clear about um but some of the so the, so there were shows that that were on tv that were trying just trying to create um, dialogue mm -hmm. um, because of how tense the the times were it was really it was a really tense time to be there um, and I know a lot of people got triggered um, and so yeah I could I could see how that would create some pressure um, on some of the older uh, generation in your church um, have those conversations generally been healthy have you guys been able to hold um, dialogue over these things within the church context no yeah. um, Part of that might be because of COVID and we're not physically in the church anymore. Um, we don't kind of run into each other as often, but um, you know, I don't know how many of the younger Korean or Asians have talked to their parents about it. Um, I, I think in my church, a number of them have. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on like a whole scale level, we haven't. And that's something that, you, you know, I kind of wanted to talk you know, we have like our own Korean like pastors, yeah, organization and stuff. It's like a, it's a whole thing, um, and I'm like wondering, like, should, do we need to have like like a discussion between the Korean American pastors and the Korean speaking pastors and talk about it? And uh, it hasn't happened. And are the hopefully are there, it will are happen. The actual but... pastors are you guys closer together ideologically than the actual church congregants are? 
Uh, could you repeat the question? Sorry. Are, are the pastors, um, those who are Korean pastors, Korean Korean pastors, and those who are EM Korean pastors, are they closer together ideologically than the actual congregants are? Um. All right. I know what that. I. Means. <laughs> I. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. It, well, even with the Korean speaking pastors, there's a younger generation coming up. With them, I think ideologically we're a lot closer. Yeah. Um, they kind of don't hold to the hierarchy and the, you know, all that stuff. And so ideologically a little bit closer. With the older Korean speaking pastors, not quite so much. Mm. Very good. Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're about to run out of time. People, thank you so much for joining us. I was hanging out with Jason Kim today. Um, thank you, Jason. He, he's uh, been a great uh, co-worker here in our conference. He's been doing some great things. He's an awesome pastor. He actually did some video work for me on my 10th year anniversary a, couple, a month ago. And, man, I'll tell you, my wife, it was my favorite thing um, that uh, was part of the night for my wife. She's like, man, your, your video, that was my favorite one. And I was like, dang, I didn't do that one. So, <laughs> thanks, Jason. Thanks, man. I did take the uh, credit for it. Now I'm playing. Um, <laughs> let's do a, a quick three, two, one. So this is a new piece called three, two, one, and, and um, it's basically the three, two, one segment. Is I'm going to ask you uh, to give me three tips, two tips, and one tip. Okay. Um, and if you could just make them succinct and short, we'll move forward. So give me three immediate tips that can help someone be more informed on the issues that are happening around them. What are three practical tips someone can do right now? to help them be more for, informed on the issues that are happening around them. Yeah, uh, be intentional. Uh, so like seek out information, consume, um, go out and read stuff, CNN, BBC, just all that stuff. And three, um, talk. I think discussion is huge. Just talk to people uh, who know more and talk to people who might not know as much. So you learn and then you explain. Ooh. I think that's three good ways to be informed all right nice that was three two two tips that will help you make more asian friends what could what two things could you do right now that'll help you gain two korean friends in your life two korean friends the first one is eat kimchi um <laughs> it's not easy to eat it if you're not used to it um the second one <laughs> I don't know if it's a thing anymore. When I was young, the best way is to stop asking if I'm North Korean. Like, know <laughs> the difference between North and South Korea. <laughs> it might not be a thing. I think more young people are more uh, educated on that. Right. When I was younger, oh, so many times. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sure way to probably not make a friend, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And one, one thing someone can do to grow awareness for other cultural groups whether that be to get to know um, the Korean culture better or whether for um, a Korean young person to get to know um, the Hispanic culture or, or, or the um, Latino culture or African-American culture, Tongan culture, Polynesians, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Uh, I mean, I think the one word is open, but more specifically, you kind of have to leave your cultural biases and perspectives behind to to understand um, and kind of stop viewing their from the perspective of your own culture which is really hard to do because it's so baked into who we are but as much as you can try to view it from a very objective perspective Ooh, um, that's a word yeah i guess objective would have been a better word <laughs> <laughs> no that that's absolutely uh true man we we are so ingrained with our culture or that which we're comfortable with that we begin to think that's the objective uh, mm -hmm. platform right and so what we tend to do is we subtly belittle other cultures or other groups. Um, hmm, very good. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for teaching me, man. Very good. <laughs> All right. Um, let's l just last couple things here as we hit the five o'clock mark. If you're joining us, we are with Pastor Jason Kim. No, Jason Kim. Mm. Uh, <laughs> got you, go. Jason. I got you, man. All right. Um, so how do you stay spiritually fed, bro? Uh, you know, it's this is a difficult time. We can get overwhelmed by social media. People think that just because you're a pastor, you're always spiritually fit because you got to read the Bible anyways to prepare sermons. But not true. It's easy for us to get into pitfalls. How do you stay spiritually fed? I'm a relational person by nature. And so the best way for me is to stay connected with people in my life who um, kind of help me through that, that the spiritual 
difficulties. Um, so there's yeah, a handful of people in my life who uh, I, I reach out to. There's one pastor in particular who we used to meet once a week uh, in Ontario um, to just make sure I'm doing spiritually okay. I was actually right. doing pretty rough last year, and so I needed kind of help in that. Uh, and then COVID came and did away with it. But yeah, it's other people just being open and sharing, um, being inspired by other people too. I think that really helps spiritually for me, kind of seeing wow. like stuff you do, stuff people in our conference, um, when they do things that inspire me, it, it helps me to, to want to do more. The transparency is ripe here. I, you said something here that I, I, I need to repeat. There's always something I need to repeat with our guests. The repeat is this, um, that if you are in ministry, uh, you're not always going to be doing well. And there are seasons when it's going to be rough and it's okay to, to, to know that you're in this place. Don't fake it. B deal with it. Deal with it. It's okay to be in that place. Share with somebody. Don't think you can soak it all up yourself. We've got enough. Um, brokenness, there's anxiety, there's depression. The, none of those things make you less faithful or makes you a worse sinner. Those are just things that happen in our life. It's okay to reach out for help mm -hmm. through, uh, through some of this stuff. Um, great, great another, another great thing that I pulled out from what you were saying is accountability partners. Have somebody you can talk to. Have somebody you trust that you know that you can share with so that when you're going through something, and this isn't just pastorship, this is like everybody. Everybody needs someone they can be able to share and talk with and get perspective on things. Man. Thanks, Chase. Uh, finally, as we close out today, why don't you inspire those who are listening today about life um, give them some tips on what to do. Speak to that young person in our world today that's watching along. Give them advice and inspiration about their journey. Would you do that for us? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think whatever journey you're going on, um, what, whatever you feel is valid. I think a lot of times we try to feel something else because that's what's expected of us. And we kind of devalue what we're feeling and going through um you know what you're what you're feeling what you're experiencing is valid to you that that is what you're going through um and so you know kind of stay true to that and it, it, one of my favorite slogans is, is uh, from nike is be true and i think that's so true and important you, you have to be true and um i think ultimately that is kind of the gospel message is whoever you are god loves you for that and all the things that we struggle with, God loves us in spite of that. And so, you know, there's obviously room for growth and room for change. But, you know, it's it's hard to live life when you're just constantly ashamed of what you're experiencing, what you're going through, because someone else, like, imparts their particular view on you. So, um, yeah, like, wh whatever you're feeling, whatever you're going through, it's it's validated it's what you're going through it's 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 you so hold on to it and god loves you <laughs> regardless you know thank you my bro yes indeed jason <laughs> thanks for, for hanging out with us today bro it has been fantastic time together here in tuesday tea time with our pastor jason kim who is pastoring in the boyle heights area is that correct that is correct. Currently, um, English Ministries at the uh, Korean Church out there. We really appreciated you sharing uh, time with us, teaching us about culture, and helping us understand the story and the journey of a Korean American here in the United States of America. Thank you, my friends, for jumping in with us here at Tuesday Tea Time. Thanks for hanging out. Please share this with somebody that you love so that they can get inspired just like you get inspired. Go over to our YouTube page, youtube.com forward slash One House SoCal. Smash that subscribe button and hit the like and uh, comment, if you will. And let's keep growing out all over Southern California. We are at 207 right now in subscriptions. We want to get to 1,000. Let's get to 1,000. I think we get to 1,000 by November. That gives us like a month and a half, a month and three-fourths to get to 1,000. Can we do it? Let's do it. When we do, we're going to have something fun. We're going to do some kind of celebration to get to our 1,000 mark. Jason Kim, you are the man. Thank you for joining us today. And my friends, next week we're going to be hanging out with the uh, wonderful music producer, Chad Manalo. We're gonna talk about music, we're gonna talk about production, we're gonna talk about faith, we're gonna talk about life, we're gonna talk about the whole deal. So you don't wanna miss out on next week. Um, join in with us, we're gonna be starting up at four o'clock like we always do. God bless you all, thanks Jace.
Any final words on our way out? Stay, stay, stay cool. Stay cool. Don't light fires. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Please don't light fires. We, <laughs> we've got enough here in Cali, man. God bless you. Thanks, Donnie, for that, uh, that write-in comment there in Korean, my friends. God bless you, friends. Happy Tuesday.